this session here is uh, by Timothy B. Terryberry, who uh, makes Codex and gives them away for free. And the uh, title is Progress in the Alliance for Open Media. Thank you. So, I thought we might start with, with a little bit of discussion on how we got where we are, and some of you may already know this, and if so, I apologize. Please bear with me, but um, let's go back in time to, to the beginning of 2015. Um, Google was hard at work on VP10, their successor to, to VP9. Um, I was, was in Auckland giving a talk at LCA on, on our dollar project and some of the successes we were having there. Um, and Cisco was working on, on their own open source uh, codec called Thor that was supposed to be aimed at, at specifically at real-time communication. Um, and that, that one wasn't, that was released a little bit later in the year, but, but we can play with timeline, timelines a little bit here. Um, so I'm giving this talk, and someone rightly asked at my talk, so are you guys talking to Google about this? You know, we have three different projects to make, make a royalty-free codec. Um, and, and the answer I gave at the time wasn't really that great of an answer. And the, you know, the, the truth is, yes, we, we were talking, but there wasn't a whole lot of urgency to it. And you know, we were going to figure out something at some point. Um, then, then something happened. Um, and, and the thing that happened is, is to start off with MPEG LA after several years of negotiation announced that, that they were going to make annual caps for HEVC, their brand, brand new standard codec, um, almost eight times higher than what they were currently charging for 264. Um, and I don't know if you know how, how codec licensing works. There's generally, you pay per unit, so, so every piece of software you ship, you have to pay some amount. And then, then there's usually some kind of annual cap and most large companies wind up paying the cap because they just ship so many units. Um, and, and most small companies p wind up paying you know, either near the cap or near nothing, and there's not a whole lot in between. So the caps are pretty important. Um, so then, then this other group of, of patent holders in, in HEVC decided that, that they didn't really think that was enough money. Um, they, they would like to have a new pool um, with their patents in it, and they were going to charge per unit fees that were about 10 times higher than what was being charged for 264. And it varied based on, on what kind of device you were going to ship. Um, and then also have no annual cap. So all that stuff I just said about, you know, everybody just pays the, no, like, like just keep paying us more and more money. Um, and they also just, uh, just as icing on the cake, added content fees, which is, you know, if you stream content in it, you need to pay them some percent of the revenue you're getting for that content, which is, you know, the reason that the broadcast industry was stuck on MPEG-2 for so long is because later codecs all had content fees and they hate them. Um, so, so we at Mozilla don't license H.264 because we don't want to support patented codecs. Um, and we weren't going to license HEVC anyway, but, but we took a look at, at how much that would actually cost. And for us, you know, someone who ships the amount of software that we ship, um, that would have been about 100 times more expensive. And we're not the biggest fish in the pond here. So, so that sort of got people's attention. Um, so a few months later, we announced the, the Alliance for Open Media, which was, was created by initially eight companies who all said, yeah, this is a problem. The, you know, the, the emperor has made a critical mistake. The, the time for our attack is now. Um, so since then, a whole bunch of, of other people have joined us. Um, some of us make hardware. Some of us make software. Some of us produce content. Some of us stream content online. Some of us do real-time conferencing. And some of us make browsers. So we have a pretty broad representation of, of the video industry. And we would all like to solve this problem. And, and the problem is this, that, that the standard way that people have made video codecs to this point really isn't working anymore. 
Um, I don't know if you know too much about the, the policy of, of how these standards bodies work, but you're not actually allowed to consider whether or not there is IPR on a particular proposal when you decide whether or not to add it to the standard. That's against the rules. And so, so what this guarantees is that you will add all the patents, right? Because nobody can stop something because you are going to, to ask for unreasonable amounts of money for your patents. Um, it's also subject to gaming in various different ways, and I, that's a whole other talk. But the point is, is people have figured out how to do this over 30 years, um, that, that these standards have been being developed, um, and they're pretty good at it now. The process is also vulnerable to, to this thing called patent holdup, where people would like you to pay them more money than their technology is actually worth just because it's in the standard. And they think you have to use the standard, so you have to pay us, like, whatever we ask. And that's how you get these factor of 100 increases over the previous generation. Um, the resulting situation is that many of the people who contributed the actual technology to HEVC, like, can't ship it in their own products because <laughs> they can't afford it. Um, and so we in the open source community have been saying all this stuff for years, but, but now it's not just us saying it anymore. Um, so, so this is Ann Aaron of Netflix at the Data Compression Conf Conference in April of last year. Um, and so Netflix was one of the earliest adopters of HEVC because you know, they want to ship 4K content to their users. And they said, this code gives us great bandwidth savings. And you know, they're, they're a for-profit business. They don't have any problem paying some, some reasonable license fee. And then they saw what the license fee was and they said, wait a minute. <laughs> And, and it's really that top bullet point right there. A royalty-free codec will remove uncertainty. It's like, it didn't even matter now if you came, came along and said, okay, we were just kidding, we're gonna actually charge you a reasonable amount of money. It's like, no, we can't plan around whether or not you decide to be reasonable today. We would like to actually know when we create a product that we can, we can actually ship it. Um, so, so, that tune changed very quickly. Um, this is Errol Feldseth of, of Cisco um, at the same conference, and, and it's right there in the third bullet point that I've highlighted there. Large volume distribution of soft clients is desired in all of its glorious passive voice. Y yes, yes it is, that's us. <laughs> we would like to give away software. Um, so I've said this idea of, of, of figuring out the licensing after you've developed the technology doesn't work. So you may reasonably ask, well, what's AOM's patent license? Um, and this is something that, that I think is, is actually a pretty good success story, so I'd like to tell you about it. Um, we negotiated among all of the AOM members um, a single royalty-free license that everyone is going to grant. So everyone is using the same license. Um, if you're familiar with Opus, Opus actually has two different licenses. This was the audio codec we worked on before this. Um, one that was used to license the Ziff and Broadcom patents, and then Skype, who also contributed technology to the codec, they, they had some different goals than us and they wrote a different license. And then they got acquired by Microsoft, and Microsoft, you know, we were able to talk Microsoft into giving them a much, giving us a much more reasonable license than what Skype was asking for. And sh you know, when when Skype had it, nobody had a problem. When Microsoft bought it, said, "Wait a minute." <laughs> um, but but we were actually able to get Microsoft to come up with a pretty reasonable license in the end. But we weren't able to get them to use the same license. So now you have to go trace through these two different licenses and figure out if you know all the obligations match up. And it's it's not ideal, but it is what it is. Um, here, we actually worked directly with Microsoft you know, to come up with this single license, um, and we actually combine elements of both the original Opus license and what Microsoft was trying to do in their license, and so now we have a unified license, um, and so less things to read, which is always good if you, you don't like reading legal documents. Um, and it has a few attractive elements. So 
Um, in contrast to other standards, it covers both the decoder and the encoder. Um, so if you go and buy one of these, these a license for, for H.264 or HEVC, you will get a license to a large list of patents on all the things that is essential to write a decoder. There's no actual guarantee you can write an encoder at all. You may still not have any of the patents you need for that. Um, be, um, so, so in our license, you can, you can, you're guaranteed to have the patents for anything that's required by the specification, which covers the decoder, or anything included with the reference implementation. So you know you can write an encoder. Um, there may be th other things you can do that might tread on somebody else's patents, and like I don't know what we can do about that, but, but you're at least guaranteed you can ship an encoder and actually use it in the real world. Um, and so you can go read the, the full license there, but there's a couple of more uh, important points in there. Um, one is it includes a defensive termination clause. So, so basically, if you sue someone over using our codec, um, you lose our license. Um, so this is actually much broader than normal defensive termination clauses. Normally, you'll say, well, if you sue me, then you lose my, my license to my patents. But we're actually saying if you know you sue Bob over there, who was using our codec for for pat infringing your patents, you lose our patents. So as the alliance gets larger and has more people um, contributing their patents to this, you know this becomes a much greater incentive to to not go around suing people for using this codec. Um, it also includes a reciprocal license grant. And, and when I first started doing this, I didn't, you know, the reciprocal license grant is something that sort of seems superfluous in light of the defensive termination clause. Um, but, but eventually figured out that, that it's actually a really great way to end a lawsuit early. Um, if somebody does sue you, you can say, no, 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 you gave me a license. Here's a motion to dismiss. The case is over. Um, but you have to be able to show that, that they actually gave you a license. You know, if you have the defensive termination clause, that doesn't really matter, right? Somebody can say, say you know, oh, I, I didn't really accept that license, so you can't terminate it. Well, like, okay, you, you're still using my patents without a license, so like, you're screwed either way, right? But with the reciprocal license clause, you need to show that they did that. Um, and everybody's first idea of, well, how do you show they accepted license? Oh, well, we'll make a website and you can click through and sign your name, right, and, and, and all these wonderful things, and, and all of which fail the, the Debian desert island test, right, which is, is, are you stranded on a desert island and somebody throws a USB stick out of a plane as they're flying over with their software on it, can you now hack on that software and comply with the license? Um, and if you have to go connect to a web page, like unless your desert island has fiber, <laughs> or you have a sat phone, like there, there may be a problem here, right? Um, so, so we actually used a suggestion that came from Joshua Gay of the Free Software Foundation. We were discussing this issue with him, which is like we, we know how to solve these problems. We just use the BSD mechanism. So, so if you include a copy of of the license with your source code, or you put the, the copy of the license with the documentation, that's a very easy to comply with affirmative act that we use in standard open source licenses all the time. And now we can signal, yes, you have accepted the license. And now everybody knows if there is a reciprocal license grant that they can rely on. Um, so this is a reciprocal license grant that is actually open source friendly and still has a strong uh, affirmative act that you can use to tell if someone signed the license. Um, and that is, I think, actually something novel. So we're quite proud of that. Um, so for all of you who, who are not in love with, with legal policy, and I know some of you probably enjoyed that, at least five, um, the rest of you are probably, probably thinking to yourself, well, like, like isn't, isn't video on the web a solved problem? Um, you know, like we have this great coda called VP9, and, and you know, if, I were, if you were going to ask me I need to build a video website today, what should I go deploy? Like, v VP9 is the answer. Um, but video is getting bigger, right? So 
4K is getting more common, and that's four times as large as 1080p. And there are companies who would love to sell you an 8K television, and that's four times larger than that. Um, they want all your sporting events to be at least 60 frames per second, and that's two times as much data as 30 frames per second. Um, and, and oh, we also want to, to add in high dynamic range, and that's another 25 to 50% on top of that. So, so we have to compress this, like that, that's a lot more bits than we're currently sending now for most video. Um, and, and video is 70% of all consumer traffic on, on the internet, and that's expected to go up. Um, so compressing all of this is, is a bit of a big deal. And that's why I'm going to switch over now and start talking about actual science. Um, so how AV1 development works, um, so it is a fully open source project, although the Alliance for Open Media is this, uh, a, a you know, industry organization, like you can go get the source code and hack on it. You do not have to join AOM to contribute to it. Um, so specific proposed coding tools are added as, as experiments, and those are controlled by build time flags. Um, so you pass to configure, enable experimental, and then enable the name of the experiment, and that can turn that experiment on or off. Um, the individual experiments get reviewed by um, the hardware team, which is the group of, of hardware members inside of AOM, um, an IPR team, which is the group of people inside of AOM who actually want to look at patents, um, and, and also the, the working group at large for you know, actual technical evaluation um, outside of just hardware. And sort of the lifetime of the experiment is it starts off, you know, you create the experiment and check it in, and it's by default disabled. Um, and then after some amount of, of review, people say, okay, that's something, that's a direction we're probably gonna go, we can enable it by default. And then once it's passed all of these reviews, you can get the flags removed, and then it's just always on. Um, there are about 50 active experiments. Um, currently, five of those are enabled by default. Um, so you can see there are a whole bunch of things that, that go on in this experiment framework sort of lets us explore a lot of different paths without having to constantly sync up and worry about other people trampling all over us, and so that's nice. Um, I'm gonna mostly focus on Mozilla's contributions in this talk. Um, that's number one because I know them the best, but, but um, the main strategy we were using in the Dalla project, which is where a lot of these things originated, was we were looking for elements that were common to lots of patents and saying, can we replace those with something different to help avoid broad swaths of patents um, all at once? And you know that, that makes our job much easier. We don't necessarily have to read those in very much detail. If we can say, there's one thing we don't do, we know we don't infringe the whole patent. So, like, so there is room to get some of those replacements in AV1. So DALA was structured very differently from, from traditional codecs for exactly this reason. Um, and some of that will mesh in with, with the contributions of all the other, AO member, other AOM members, and some of it won't. Um, we'll take the pieces that will. Um, we don't have to um, employ this strategy quite as rigorously as we did when we were doing everything ourselves. Um, one is the AOM members themselves have patents too. Um, remember some of the names from, from those slides? They're, they are large companies that, that do have their own patent portfolios. Um, and we should use those patented things that makes our license stronger and, and helps create uh, a well-protected codec um, as long as we're all offering these things for, to be royalty-free. Um, we also have a lot more members now than you know, just us doing everything by ourselves. So there's more people with experience of what patents are out there and where to look um, and who can share the job of reading the patents. So we can perhaps delve into some of those areas where before I would have said, eh, it's too hard. Like, let's just avoid that completely. Um, and, and also the Alliance has money to pay lawyers, um, which is to say m more money than we had as just Mozilla. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the things that, that we are trying to get in. Um, so the first one here is 
a little bit of background. Um, most video codecs use what's called binary entropy coding. Um, so the, the entropy coding is the process of actually writing out the bits to the bit stream that represent the video. And the idea is you only code binary decisions. So, so the actual number of bits that you write out depends on the probability of you having a zero versus the probability of having you of having a one. And it's very cheap to code one binary decision um, just because it's very simple to do. And it's very cheap to do binary probability modeling. You just have like a one byte lookup that says what the probability is and a state machine that you can use to map the probabilities as they change. Um, and then you have various schemes on top of that for converting non-binary values to binary decisions, um, also called binarization. Um, kind of the problem with this is that you need to code lots of binary decisions to represent these, these non-binary values. And entropy coding is an inherently serial process. So this is completely unparalyzable. Um, so our idea on the DALA project was non-binary entropy coding, um, which is a very old idea. If you go look at like, the original um, work on, on arithmetic coding, like there was no idea that we would restrict things to binary. People just did it because you know, it made coding a single symbol simpler. Um, so instead, we're going to code values that have up to 16 different possibilities, um, which is essentially equivalent to coding four binary decisions. Um, and it's a little bit more expensive to code one of these things than it is to code a binary value, but it's not four times more expensive, because a lot of the overheads in coding something are, are per symbol. Um, so what this is really doing is, is effectively giving us a small amount of parallelism. Um, we are, there are some problems we have to solve, like a one byte probability cannot model the 16 different probabilities we need for each of these 16 different values. Um, so we have to have vectors of probabilities, and but we can manipulate those with SIMD, and that's easily parallelizable, so that's not a problem. Um, and on top of that, like we don't do the same binarization stuff that everybody else does. We're actually converting things to hex, which you know you can it's the same thing, right? But but for patents, this matters, right? And so, <laughs> um, and, and we're often going the other direction and saying, like, like, I actually have a bunch of different values that I would like to code, and I'm going to combine them into one symbol instead of you know, splitting one thing into multiple binary decisions to code. Um, so, so that helps us be different, and, and that's always good for, for IPR avoidance. Um, so being able to code fewer symbols means we have um, a shorter serial dependency chain. So I had said this, this process is inherently serial. Um, a lot of those dependencies are, again, per symbol. Um, shorter serial dependency chains means hardware can use lower clock rates, and that means devices use less power. Um, so the, the clock rate is actually largely driven by the amount of bits you have to clock through your entropy coder for, for current modern video codecs. Um, so by, by shortening that, by reducing that number of symbols and shortening those dependency chains, like that alone is enough to let them run at lower clock rates. Um, so we have two new underlying engines that can do this, this non-binary coding. Um, one is the DALA EC experiment that is currently enabled by default. Um, and the other is an experiment from Google called ANS, which stands for Asymmetric Numeral Systems, um, which is a very similar idea, um, but is faster in software, but has complications for hardware or real-time uses. Basically, they, they get some simplifications, but they require you to encode things in the reverse order that you decode them, um, which means in hardware, you'd have to buffer up a bunch of decisions. Um, and hardware doesn't like having buffers or like revisiting things. Um, so we don't know which way we're actually going to wind up going at the end of the day, but, but the important stuff to us is that, that the underlying coding is non-binary. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter to us. We'll use the one that the hardware guys let us use. Um, currently, we are, we are converting probabilities directly from the binary probabilities that were used in VP9 before. So there's like a thing that runs at the beginning of the frame, and it, you, you have these big binary trees that were compose, composed of all this binarization process. 
and we convert those into a single flat table of, of probabilities that we then use. And that's not ideal, that's just the way we did it to get something integrated from the start. Um, so this is more of the direction we would like to go, is we would like to be much more adaptive. Um, and there's an experiment for that called EC Adapt. Um, this is actually work led by Cisco. It is based on some of the stuff that we were doing in Dala, but, but they are taking the lead on this, which I think is great. It is wonderful to have collaborators. Um, and sort of the, the background on this is, is VP9 has two ways to control what the probabilities of all these symbols are. Um, one is you can explicitly send what probabilities to use in the frame header. Um, so that's fine, but, but it takes a bunch of bits to do that, and the number of bits is relatively independent of, of the size of your video, you know, what resolution it's running at, what bit rate it's running at. Um, there's, you, can, you can save a little bit, so there, there are default probabilities, and there's a flag to say just use the default instead of setting a full probability. So you can get this a little bit smaller for, for lower resolutions, but, but there's not that much give there. Um, the other problem is that you, in order to know what probability to use for this entire frame, because it will never change, um, you need to have gone through and encoded the whole frame and made all of your decisions so you know like what the probability of each of these things actually are, so you know what to write in the header. Um, so that adds latency um, in the sense of if you're trying to do real-time communication, like what you'd really like to do is after I process the first you know, row of video data, I already want to be writing bits onto the wire, you know, saying th this is what the, the encoding of this video is, and here I can't write anything into a packet until I've encoded the whole frame. Um, unless, you know, you use suboptimal probabilities, and then there's a bit rate cost for that. Um, what that also means is that when you're doing this encoding and you're making all of your decisions, you don't actually know what your final probabilities are gonna be, so you don't know how many bits each thing you're going to write out is going to take, because the probabilities control how many bits something takes. So you make your decisions with suboptimal probabilities, like the probabilities from the previous frame or something, and, and you know it'd be nice to be able to use the actual probabilities. Um, the other thing VP9 can do is it can update those probabilities from the previous frame statistics. Um, which is great, like that helps you reduce the number of, of probabilities you need to send in the frame header. Um, but what it means is that you're not robust to packet losses. So again, if you're doing real-time communication and you lose a packet, like y you now can't decode any future packets because all your probabilities are wrong and your entropy coder will desync and you'll have garbage. Um, it also limits your ability to parallelize encoding in the frame because you can't actually start encoding the next frame until you've finished coding the previous frame so that you know what the probabilities are that you're going to use. So normally the way, this, the way this works is once you've encoded the first few rows of a frame, you can already start from the next one, you know, as long as you know you aren't gonna predict from way down here or something. Um, so, so that gets limited when you need to use the probabilities from that frame to do your encoding. So, so the idea of adaptive entropy coding is that we're actually going to adapt these probabilities per symbol, and the observation is that, that we're already doing most of the work because we have this feed forward of the probabilities from the previous frame. So like we already had to count all the occurrences of all the symbols. Um, we were just only updating those probabilities once per frame. Um, so now we can just do it every symbol and it's a little bit more work, but, but not that much more. Um, the cost of, of, of learning these probabilities now scales with the number of symbols coded. Um, so when you start out coding, you know, like you're gonna have a probability that's gonna be wrong, and then you're gonna code a few symbols, and you figure out, oh no, this is what the actual probability of, of the symbols in this context was, and you know, there is a little bit of inefficiency there that happens at the beginning, but then you, then you flatten out and, and it asymptotically converges. Um, and you can go figure out what the actual a number of bits of overhead that is, and it's roughly log n, where n is the number of symbols you code in a given context. Um, what that means is that, that when your bit rate is lower and your, your resolution is lower, you will have less overhead, right? So this scales much better um, and, and doesn't have as high impact on, on low resolutions. 
and this is actually important to a lot of the people in AOM. If you, you, know, you look at YouTube and you look at Netflix and they're saying, like, we're trying to de deliver this content to, to you know, the next billion users and the next billion users have really crappy networks and we will send them postage stamp video and that's better than having no video. Um, so, so low resolution performance is still important. Um, the other nice thing about doing per symbol adaptation is it can adapt to non-stationary statistics. So before we had one probability that lasted over the whole frame and we couldn't change it, which means if stuff at the beginning of the frame had, had you know, was really high probability and stuff at the end of the frame was really low probability, you know, we would do something in the middle and, and be wrong for both of them. Um, whereas this it can figure out you know, at the beginning, oh yes, this is really high probability and then when it starts getting to the low probability region, it says, oh no, like, like, let, me, let me go fix that. Um, so, so this experiment is, is already showing some promise. Um, it gives you know, relatively minor gains, but, but reasonable gains in the high delay case of you know, somewhere between 0.4 and 0.8% reductions in bit rate. Um, and then the new error resilient case, which is the case we have to deal with of, of you, know, you have to be able to handle losing a packet so you can't use these feed forward statistics from previous frames. Um, it gives uh, substantially larger gains. Um, and this patch is not even doing the thing I said before where we, where we wanted to use the actual probabilities um, during our decision making process um, just because rewriting the encoder to do that is a bunch of work that hasn't happened yet. Um, so we can make these better um, because now after you've coded every symbol, you know, you can actually compute what the probability will be for the next symbol so you'll know as you're making each decision exactly how many bits everything you're going to code is going to take. And it's a little bit more work to do that, but, but you can get better compression if you do. Um, so the next technique that we are integrating is, is this adaptive deringing filter in the deringing experiment. Um, so if you have seen images from, from DALA as it was being developed, you may have noticed that it tends to have a lot of ringing artifacts. Um, and there's a lot of various reasons for that that I won't go into. But one of the things we did was we made a pretty good filter to, to reduce them. Um, and the way it works is it tries to estimate the dominant orientation of, of each block and then do strong smoothing parallel to that orientation. So if you have a, a sharp edge, it will, it will figure out what the direction of that edge is and then smooth very much along that and then do a little bit lighter smoothing orthogonal to that. Um, and this turns out to be a really robust technique. Um, like we don't have to get the orientation estimate exactly correct, but it, what it's basically letting us do is just do sm stronger smoothing in that direction than we might have otherwise been able to get away with. Um, and then we can signal on a 64 by 64 block basis exactly how strong this filter should be, you know, picking from just a few levels. And that's very cheap because there aren't that many 64 by 64 blocks in a video frame. Um, and it also lets us shut it off if it's, if it's hurting things and over smoothing stuff um, so we can guarantee that we don't hurt anything. Um, and the nice thing about this is it kind of sits at the end of the whole video decoding pipeline. Um, so we can just plug it into AV1 without having to change very much. Um, and when we do, it, it works fine. Um, we get gains somewhere between one and a half, one to one and a half percent in the high delay case. And in low delay case, we get about twice that. Um, and basically the reason is, is in low delay, you wind up normally doing less smoothing to begin with. So the smoothing we do helps more. Um, and that's on the various metrics we, we have. Um, I think the actual visual improvement of this is slightly larger than those numbers might indicate. Um, so the next technique is this idea of perceptual vector quantization. And if you want to know what all the details of how that works is, I would love to refer you to my 2015 LCA talk. Um, I don't have time to go into them all here. I'll just say it involves hyperspheres and householder reflections. Some of you may want to know what that is and some of you may not. Um, but, but there's the big question of, of will it actually work outside of, of DALA? Um, so we, we actually completed an initial integration into AV1 in November. Um, and this was just a first test where we were optimizing for, for PSNR. So PSNR is sort of the, the 
you know, lowest common denominator metric that people optimize for. Um, stands for peak signal to noise ratio. And, and, you know, it's not actually a very good perceptual metric, but, but um, it was a first step to make sure that we're on the same baseline as everyone else. Um, overall, we got about 0.1% worse piece in R, which is, you know, no big deal. And the other metrics were kind of 1% worse to 1% better. Um, so that seemed to be working fine. Um, since then, there have been regressions because other people checked code into the code base, which I guess happens sometimes. Um, so now we're 3 to 4% worse, and we don't know exactly why, but we're fixing bugs. But the real problem is we're 20%, 20 times slower. Um, and so that was surprising to us. We weren't expecting that. Part of that was, was we, we were missing SIMD, so we knew that would be, you know, a factor of 3 to 4. Um, and we require an extra forward transform, and you know, that should only be like 10% or something. And our search is a little bit slower than Scalar, but, but all of that stuff was true in DALA, and DALA wasn't 20 times slower than, than VP10. Um, the real problem is quantization gets called a lot. <laughs> um, so AV1 has a lot more decisions to make than DALA, and if we ran some benchmarks and it was 165 times more, and it calls this transform and quantization and encoding for all of those decisions. Um, that's gonna get worse. So I'm not going to go through all of those experiments, but, but here are a bunch of the other things that people are adding, and they all increase that search space by, by you know, orders of magnitude. And so if you add all that stuff in, the, the VP10 is about 65 times slower than VP9 without PVQ, and then we're going to add a factor of 20 on top of that. <laughs> um, so, so how do you optimize these things? Like, like the obvious thing is stop calling the function so much. <laughs> Um, some, some of this is like we can just search less of the space, right? Um, we have, have heuristics and some of the, that let us, you know, eliminate some of those things, and some of the experiments already do this, but the other thing we can do is just replace this transform and quantization encoding with a really simple model that, you know, and make our decisions using the model. Um, and then we can call the quantizer for the final encode, and then, you know, maybe if decisions are close, we'll add in a few things that we actually do the full evaluation for. Um, so, so the idea is you measure something cheap, like the, the error of the prediction or something, which means you don't have to do any of the stuff after the prediction step. Um, you add a few extra parameters and, you know, look up some stuff in a table and do some simple math. And it doesn't have to actually be accurate, it just has to make accurate trade-offs. Um, this will also benefit the whole codec, so like independent of PVQ, it lets that huge 65x larger search space slow down, or lets us, you know, explore that much more rapidly. And this is something that's usually done after standardization, but, but it turns out that we actually care about whether something is implementable in the real world, um, and we care about time to market, so we, we don't want to spend five years after the standard is done, like coming up with a practical implementation. So we think it's worth doing this now. Um, this is still a work in progress, but, but we're hoping to have results soon. Um, after that, we're going to, to actually start turning on some of the perceptual features. Um, those are going to hurt PSNR, but make things look better. Um, and I'm running out of time, so I will go through this a bit more quickly. Um, the first one is just doing a better distortion function. And I will just show you some examples. All we have done here is changed how the encoder measure errors. We haven't even turned PVQ on. Like, try looking at the difference between those two images, especially along the edges. And so the, the problem here is, is if you have quantization like PVQ that's very smart and your distortion function is very dumb, like bad things will happen, but the other way around works much better. Um, so regressions aside, like, like we think this is, this is still promising work. We have a plan for, for achieving complexity that's reasonable, but it's still uncertain whether or not this will actually go in. Um, we're working on a lot more things. Um, I'll especially call out the Inscripton-based bitstream analyzer, so like we can actually go pull a git revision from your GitHub repository, compile it, um, with whatever experiment you've done and let you analyze all of the encoded video with that. Um, so that is actually really cool, runs in the browser, because we're a browser company. How are we doing? Um, so we got some new HEVC advanced terms. Um, 
a few months after our formation. It's still 10 times more expensive than 264, but, but for some of the alliance, like, that's progress. <laughs> um, however, like, Technicolor left HEVC Advance, so you have to buy their patents separately, and like a third of the HEVC patent pullers are not in any pool yet, so that's a problem. Oh, and, and, and the codec. Um, so these are results from, from Q4. Um, you can see on the left is X265, which is a popular open source HEVC encoder. Um, then, then from Q4 start to end, you can see how much progress we made. Um, if you turn on a bunch of additional experiments, you can see we're actually m doing much better, but those are not final yet. Um, and then the goal there is sort of about 30% better than, than where X265 was, and we think that's sort of a reasonable target of, of you know, a big enough jump that people would ship it. Um, there are links for contributing, and if you have any questions or we have time for them, I'll take them now. Hello? Do we have any questions? Um, so this is actually all spelled out in the Alliance membership agreements. Um, if they have joined at the, f the founder level, which is sort of the original group of eight companies, and you know, we might be willing to let some more people in at that level, depending on who they are, um, then we use the W3C patent exclusion process. So when we go to finalize the standard, if they make a list of these are the things you aren't allowed to use, then if we're using any of those things, we take it out of the standard. Um, if they join anything less than that level, then the only way that, that they can tell us we're not allowed to use their patents is to leave the AOM. Um, and if they do that, any patents that they had within a certain time frame, and I forget the exact number, in the 60 or 45 days that, that we were using bef prior to their, you know, that amount of time prior to them leaving, we still get to use. And so it's spelled out in the agreements when you join. Um, do you have any ballpark idea of when this stuff might actually be shipping? Um, so, so when we originally formed the Alliance, we said the end of last year. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so yeah, software schedules only slip right. Um, our, our current plan is to do bitstream freeze in October. Um, I think that one is a bit more of a reasonable goal. Anyone? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.